Hello again everyone, Hashi here. It's great to see you and may I say, you're looking great today. You wanna mess around with some visual effect techniques? Well, let's get right to it. Last time we horsed around with this guy, and today in part three of our Game of Thrones series, we're gonna play with some humans. A whole spectrum of them. Humans in peril, in battle, undead, exploding, and beyond dead. Okay, it's a weak theme, but we've got a lot of super helpful information in here. As usual, we're covering a whole lot in this video, and if you're in a hurry, you can always quickly browse through the video using our lovely table of contents below, but you should really watch everything because we've got a present for you. Sometimes the most complicated part of shots like these isn't the VFX. It was getting an amazing stunt performer. Costumes, props, fans, lights, and a green screen studio, and honestly, none of that's very easy. So a special thanks goes out to Ronan Trainer, Marta Svetek, and all of our talented fight performers from the UK's independent drama, and to Mookie International for producing all of this beautiful content. And I, and I can only cover so much today, and you know, since we've got all this amazing footage lying around. Many stunt people fought and died to bring you this green screen footage. They didn't die. They're actually super in control of their bodies, really talented. Uh, this high quality footage, all of it, is available now thanks to the amazing Digital Pigeon. Wait, no, uh, not this thing, uh, this. This is Digital Pigeon, an amazing site for sharing large files, including large media that needs to be previewed fast. They're graciously hosting these 17 gigabytes of individual clips here. The footage was shot in slow motion, and each green screen piece is cropped down for efficiency. These experts repeated some of the fight moves at multiple angles, and it just looks like they had a bloody amazing time. From the link below, you can quickly preview all the files we have available. Since these are large files, just download what you need by clicking right here. Also, 17 gigabytes isn't really meant to be zipped. So check out these glorious files, and also check out digitalpigeon.com when you need to send large files fast. Now, every green screen shot may present a random challenge of its own, but if you're rocking Primat Key or 6, this high quality footage is usually as simple as hitting auto define key, cleaning the background, restoring the foreground, and then combining your character with stock footage, photos, whatever. We want to see you make something cool or funny with this stuff, so tag us wherever you post this so we can share your work, you know, and feel like proud parents. These should jumpstart your creativity and be a great way for you to start practicing and putting together your own scenes. Today up top, I'll show you a few examples of working with this footage, and then later on, we'll play with downloading and bringing some digital characters to life. I'm going to move along a little quicker to make sure that we get to cover all of these exciting bits. Let's do it. Let's start with this guy who's having a stressful day at the office. Ladies and gentlemen, meet James Unsworth, who we lovingly called the Dude of Beards. We filmed the dude in front of a green screen, holding up a shield and doing his very best to not die. I'm going to use Primat Keyer to key out the green screen, utilizing the spill killer to try to fight off all of this green reflecting in all the silver parts of his costume. I'll admit it was a little tricky to get the balance just right, but once I did, it was time to combine him with this background I downloaded from Pixhear. I apply a color composite matcher to my knight and change his target midpoint to one of these kind of golder sepia tones from the background. With my color blindness, anytime I can use a color matching filter, the more confident I feel in my composition going forward. Next, this knight needed to look more like he was making contact with the ground, and for that I'm going to use VFX Shadow. As you've seen me use before, VFX Shadow allows me to establish a guide ground plane and then set a direction for my cast shadow, and do my best to match these shadows that are kind of in the background of this photo. The background image is super sharp throughout, so to simulate a little bit more depth of field, I'll apply Universe Spot Blur. I set the spot position to the far end of this hallway, switch it from an ellipse to a rectangle, adjust the width and height. The more this is cranked up, the more it looks a little bit like a tilt shift effect, but that's not what I want, so I'm going to turn it down to a pretty subtle amount. If you don't have Spot Blur, you could always create a compound blur map and then apply it to this layer. To liven up my comp, I'm bringing in some burning debris from Action VFX. I'll scatter them around the comp in a few places that I think will look good because, you know, dirt and sand, super flammable. 
Uh, this might seem obvious, but you should always make sure the scale and speed of your fire matches the scale and speed of where you're compositing it to. If your fire is scaled up, but moving too fast, it looks wrong, and if you shrink it down, it'll appear slower and equally wrong. My original piece of footage is in slow motion, and luckily, almost all the action VFX elements are shot at 60 frames per second. This means I can right-click and interpret the footage of any of these to conform to a 24 frame per second rate effectively putting them in slow motion. You can see the frame rate of this footage has changed up here at the top of the project window. In fact, since I know I want all of this stock footage to play slower, I can right click on that piece of footage, then go to interpret footage and say remember interpretation, or control alt C, and then I could select the rest of my stock elements all at once and press control alt V to paste that 24 frame per second interpretation across the board. And, uh, Command, of course, if you're on a Mac. Alright, let's shoot this guy with some flaming arrows. I photoshopped this lousy-looking arrow, uh, which I'll import and make its own composition. Combining it with one of the torch assets from Action VFX makes it, like, 20 times cooler. Then with two keyframes and a slight arc, these arrows can fly dangerously through frame, creating dread. But maybe some of these other enemy archers are slightly better than this, and they hit this dude right in the shield. How do we do that? We create a null called shield, then we click on the original footage layer and track motion. If you did things in this order, the motion target should automatically be the shield layer, and now all you need is a couple of high contrast points to track the position and rotation. I'm going to ignore scale because I don't think it'll help in this case. Then it's simply a matter of parenting a few arrow layers to the shield null, masking them a bit and dragging them behind our dude of beards video layer. You could slap on some different color corrections so these arrows don't look identical if you want. Or you could just you know, accept the exceptional craftsmanship of these enemy combatants. Next, let's add a dynamic element to this shield. I'll drag in my pre-comp of that flaming arrow and parent it to the shield layer right here. Then I'll add a few keyframes to have that arrow slide into place as if sticking in the shield. In this case, the shield is moving so little and the arrow comes in so fast it isn't obvious that the arrow is a child of that shield, but if you did this in a wider shot, I would suggest splitting the clip, so one part of the arrow is not parented the shield until it makes contact. Speaking of contact, let's throw a fireball in right as the arrow hits the shield. I'm not going to parent this one to anything, I'm just going to let that fire breathe and kind of flame out right where it is. I will parent a bit of this ground fire asset to the shield, and I'll animate a little subtract mask to time its appearance with that arrow strike. Then in the far foreground, I'll throw in some sideways embers, and in the background, I'll add some burn marks around these two ground fire areas. These are just stock images, but if you ever need to create something like this on your own, just use some fractal noise and some radial blur. I'll pre-comp these 3D layers along with the background so they'll work in super comp, which you've seen me use in part one and two of this series. Just like before, I'll select all my layers and select the Super Comp effect, and all my layers are reunited in the magical, graphical workspace that is Super Comp. Applying some flame presets to the fiery elements automatically adds some nice wraps and heat distortion, and tweaking around with some of the integration presets can help our knight sit right in between all these flaming arrows. Let's add an adjustment layer with some mojo on top and some universe heat wave to make it even hotter in here. And what I love about working with Super Comp is that I could throw in a new fire asset or something and get it integrating almost immediately. Also, those of you with functioning eyes out there have probably noticed there's some green spilling into our dude, possibly the whole time. So to tidy that up, I'll add Colorista and pull down the saturation of the green highlights. And look at that, guys. Pretty cool. At this point, I think it's obvious that if you've got a little bit of well-produced green screen footage and a background to match, you can use your traditional compositing skills or a unique tool like Super Comp to put together unique things that no one's ever seen before. You could even get all stylized with these assets and probably do something wild that I haven't even thought of yet. Now let's move on to Chapter 2. Now one thing that was pretty cool in the old GOT series was the way those White Walkers really had an aversion to certain materials, you know? They just shattered out of existence when hit. 
Now we've covered disintegrations before, and that's a handy template you can go download right now if you'd like. Uh, but here I want to create an almost entirely digital shot, mimicking this one from the show. So I'll start with a clip of this guy swinging a sword. I'll time stretch him to 40% so he's playing closer to real time. Lastly, I key him out, with practically no trouble. I place him in a comp along with a frame from that original clip I'm mimicking, so I can start tinkering with the colors. For the most part, it's a combination of adjusting individual color curves and using color matching filters that source that original reference image. As I add in each new element throughout this video, I'll be tinkering with the color corrections along the way. I may not always stop in detail to talk about it, otherwise we'll be here all day. Next, I need a background. So I hit up Pix here where I find this image of an oldish looking castle with some snow on it. In Photoshop, I paste some generic wintry landscape over this waterfront part and use a super feathered brush to speckle the background with some fog. I save the flattened image and bring it back into After Effects, where I can paste in a color matching filter and then do the old make it a 3D card, adjust the anchor point to some optimal folding point, duplicate the layer, and then fold it on itself. Also, if I make the actor a 3D card, now I can move my camera around and bring the whole thing to life a little more. To simulate some camera shake, I add a wiggle expression to the position and the X rotation of the camera. <laughs> and that sound means it's time for a wiggly pro tip for you. Hi, I'm Hashi, and most of us know wiggle expressions like this. But when I use them, I add a seed random expression just before to lock in that wiggle motion. You've probably noticed that when you add or move layers in a comp with wiggles expressions, those wiggles are recalculated. No big deal, really. But if you define the random seed ahead of time, then you can change your comp and your wiggles will stay the same. Hey, wake up, Lucky! We're talking about expressions! This is especially helpful with things like camera shakes, because sometimes After Effects caches layers with effects that rely on the camera. If not, it's got to re-render them each time you add a layer. And that wastes time. So remember, seed, random, pick some arbitrary but unique value in parentheses. And thank you for tuning in for this Red Giant Pro Tip. You might like to subscribe to our channel. And happy wiggling! You love it. All right, this camera move is good, but the background's too bright. So I'll darken it and add an adjustment layer with Magic Bullet Mojo, which I'll constantly be tinkering with a bit. And can we just agree that if one of my layers spontaneously changes a bit later, it's because I tweaked the color correction. Cool, cool, cool. I'm gonna add some shadow to my soldier using VFX Shadow with a simple softness so he looks a little bit more integrated. I'll bring in a foreground and a background fog layer from Action VFX. For both, I'll add the set matte effect so they have an alpha now, then a fill effect so they match my background fog exactly, and I can use the alpha curves to force them to be a little bit more opaque. We're on our way now and Oh, all our pain could be solved with three keyframes. But I'm pretty sure I promised you more, so to bring this shot even more to life, we gotta add some death. In the form of a completely CGI character. Don't be afraid. And we've actually kind of covered this before on Cheap Tricks. You start at Mixamo.com, where you can download free animations of characters. They even have several undead looking characters if you want one of these. But say I don't, uh, I can go to Sketchfab, search for downloadable zombies, and then probably find something great. So long as it's a human morphotype, I can download and unpack the files if it's an FBX or OBJ, and upload it right back to Mixamo. Place some rigging guides, and then watch the miracle of cloud computing. Finding the right animation for your piece can be somewhat of an art. I'm gonna search through this massive online database to try to find something appropriate for the zombie attack. And I'll settle on this one called... Oh. <clears throat> well, uh, I download that file, and now I need to turn this nice little animated FBX into an OBJ sequence, so it can render in Element 3D. Now I could do this in Cinema 4D or in Blender. And you know what, in fact, let's just throw them both up here. Import your animated FBX in either. If you're in Cinema, group everything together. If you're in Blender, delete this f***ing cube. In Cinema, you can use Riptide Pro or Steadybake's X-Rec to export a model sequence. 
In Blender, you say export OBJ, and then in the options over here on the side, check the animation box. Then you let them do their thing, filling up folders with delicious 3D models. And that's it, we can go back to After Effects now and add a solid, we'll apply element, and then inside there, we'll make sure to select import sequence, and then click on the first frame of our exported zombie collection. You'll know you've properly imported a sequence because it'll show the frame count right here. Now all we gotta do is figure out which of these textures is the body so we can relink those textures that came from Sketchfab. We'll click out of there and then an element under group one will create a group null. Let's quickly pop him behind the foreground fog layer. And then we'll use that group null to place, rotate, and scale our zombie. I mean, our, our white, white walker in place. Now, Element has a handful of lighting options, including the power to cast shadows. But I'm lazy, and I don't really want to deal with actual lights. So instead, I'll go to render settings, lighting, and use the single light preset, and rotate it around until it looks like some faint top lighting. After all, this is all really diffuse. I also go to Physical Environment, and I'll select my castle background to override the default. You can add some motion blur using a variety of methods. I'm using Real Smart today. But if I were really smart, I would have remembered to add a ground plane layer in Element and set its material to Matte Shadow. All right, okay, how are we doing? Nice. Uh, but let's make this zombie swipe a little bit more imminent. Uh, he doesn't really go into full swing mode until about frame 16. So we'll go back to the particle, look, baked animation, and add a frame offset of 16 frames. Great, now they're attacking each other at the same time. But I don't need this follow through action, so I'll add a keyframe to the playback speed right here where I want it to stop, and then add a 0% speed keyframe one frame later. Like he's playing freeze tag or something. And now begins our process of just overloading this one layer with a ton of effects. Now, remember that effect called Shatter? We used it to Thanos me a while back, and we're basically gonna do that same thing here as a one-off. I'll add the plugin, which by default shows this wireframe of sorts. I'll change the shape to the glass pattern with a bunch of repetitions. I'll move the position of the Force 1 over here somewhere, and then add some keyframes to the radius for the shatter. So it's zero at the beginning, and then it spreads out to cover the whole walker once he's struck. Leaving this all in wireframe mode helps me kind of preview what's gonna happen a little faster. If I tweak some of the physics settings, I can get a shatter shape that I like, and it's a simulation, so you gotta play around with it. When you're ready, switch your view mode to rendered. And I'm actually gonna drag this shatter effect up before my real smart motion blur because I'm, you know. Uh, in fact, a uh, mini pro tip, when possible, arrange effects in the effects window in a thoughtful order, by which I mean the most computationally optimal order. Element has to exist, then it needs to shatter before I add motion blur. But there's no reason my color correction needs to be before the motion blur, because then it's wasting time rendering phantom frames just to get a result. It's like asking someone to peel an apple after they slice it. it, it I mean, and it, and it may not be a lot of time saved, but with anything like a fake motion blur or time echoes, consider it. All right, let's see how this shattering zombie looks. Kind of like trash, but that's okay. Shatter's an old plugin, and sometimes when you get a team of old guys together, the magic happens. So let's keyframe some roughened edges to go from practically no erosion all the way to this blotchier shape as it explodes. We'll keyframe some brightness and contrast to kind of snowify him a bit. And we'll copy over some of those color matching filters from our soldier layer. And then, no kidding, we'll add some bevel alpha to this mix to make the chunks look a little bit more like volumetric snow. With all of this stuff motion blurred, we're about one or two pieces of stock footage away from completing the shatter effect. I'm gonna use this powder hit from Action Essentials, which is literally in like every action movie kid. And then one of the free blood mist elements from Action VFX. I've got a whole collection of them. All I do is bring it in, invert, unmolt, and tint it for this comp. 
Now I designed the physics in my shattering layer to look like high wind. So I'll add an additional foreground cloud element with a speed cranked up and a few keyframes to kind of carry out those powder bursts. And now I've got a nice high wind kind of effect. I'm noticing that it looks a little strange that he freezes all at once, meaning my snow tinting is kind of happening all at once. So to fix that, I'm gonna use a really bloated solution, which is duplicating my whole zomboid layer. Then on the bottom copy, I'll disable that brightness and contrast effect, and then go to shatter and tell it to just render the layer, which means the parts that haven't been broken away. Then I'll go to the top zomboid layer, to its shatter effect and tell it to render just the pieces that have broken away. The result should be the light snow breaking away over the darker legs. So let's see how we're doing and not too shabby. But he does look lonely and to his company, but zombies are a crowd. All right, imagine you want a horde of zombies. Sounds intimidating, but it doesn't have to be. What we just did with Walker Numero Uno is relatively close to what we would do to create a whole horde of zombies using Element. You repeat some of those steps, finding models on Sketchfab. You're really in the market for more of a game quality character, since each frame is going to have to be saved as a separate file. You don't want a ginormous file, and also Mixamo won't like that either. But throw your model into Mixamo. Oh, that's for something else. Throw your model into Mixamo and then browse through the many zombie animations and walks they have. Then check this in place box. Then save those FBX files, export some OBJ sequences. The more characters you do this to, the more variety you'll have in your final, and variety is good. Unless you're lazy like me, then fog and small is good. I'm gonna demonstrate this all in a clean comp, just so you can see it better. We'll throw in a temp background, then a solid with element, and then an element will import each zombie sequence. We'll scale them about the same, and then drag them each into their own group. They've each got kind of their own color and gait, which will be helpful. I'll also add a group four, which is just a big ground plane, with the matte shadow setting on its material. I'll exit element and go to each group, and under group utilities, I'll create a group null. I'll rename this top one floor, and I'll parent the other ones to it. That way the floor is kind of something I can rotate and scale around later if I want control of this whole setup. And if we did everything right, we've got the walking dead on our hands. I'm gonna go ahead and add some ambient occlusion to everything, sampling one of these darker background colors. And if I rotate this ground plane a little, you can see we're getting some nice contact AO too. In fact, if I were to dive into Element and click on my plane, I'd enable it as a mirror surface, go to the material, check matte reflection, and turn up the reflectivity. I'd add some normal bump mapping to it so the reflection would be a little bit warbly. And cool. Too reflective though, so let's uh, turn down the glossiness and reflectivity of that material a bit. Yeah. And using the Z gizmos, I can animate all these groups to move forward together over time. Now obviously I need to play around with how fast each group moves based on its baked animation. Otherwise I've got like a slippery little situation going on here. So yeah, this is all closer now. I, I'm not super concerned with this contact being rock solid because it's about to get a whole lot more crowded in here. Now at its core, Element is kind of a 3D particle replicator to some degree, meaning that if I go up here to group one, I'll see that one of the very first options is the particle replicator. I'll set the shape to be a plane and then turn up the particle count, giving me this cute little synchronized group of zombies. Let's scale the X and Z shape up and so they're spread out a little bit more. And then under the particle look, baked animation, I can change the loop mode to random loop, offsetting their timing across the board and giving me these great zombies moving out of step with each other. Lastly, I'll go to the replicator effects and up the X scatter. And now I can repeat that same process with each of these three groups. Now the great part is that each of these groups is still being dragged slowly forward by its own group null, allowing the fast zombies to move faster than the slow ones but with very little input needed to make this happen. 
I can rotate my camera around, enable the fog, slap some motion blur on, and then get something like this. Or this. Or this. Now, these guys aren't super high quality, but they work well as a horde moving together in the background of a comp. And depending on your models and the amount of time you spend setting them up, you really could get some pretty decent results. And I haven't even talked about adding lights or playing with the output settings, which can all allow you to render them even better. Keep in mind you could use this process to pretty easily create background crowds that are cheering or at a concert or a marathon, maybe a fleet of soldiers heading into battle. I'm going to drop this particular crowd into the background of our original shot and then pepper in a few of our awesome green screen soldiers just so there's some real humans in there. And since our very own Marta was willing to die courageously for this cause, I will add some blood splatter and make sure that her death wasn't in vain. I mean, if a zombie ever, you know, runs past you menacingly, look out. Instant death. But it's all good. It's all good. I've added some snow in the foreground and the midground because why not? And I'm pretty darn satisfied with this one hit kill mode. But what if something were more than dead? What if you wanted to give birth to something that was just horrid? Well, you'd go download Diego Lujan Garcia's skeleton model and pop it into Cinema 4D. He's pretty high quality, so I'll add a polygon reduction group and throw in any pieces of the anatomy that I don't think will need that much definition, like his legs. Then I'll bend his arms out a little bit so Mixamo might like him more. I'll open his jaw and then use the mesh brush to make him look a little more sinister. I export this OBJ and import him to Mixamo. And luckily, he maps. His hands didn't really work out, which is something I've run into before but I'm going to file that under not crucial for this piece. And there are so many fun Jason and the Argonauti things you could do with an animated skeleton, but I'm thinking about one particular moment in Game of Thrones, so I think that a creepy crawl works. Obviously, I save the animated FBX and then export an OBJ sequence of it and go over to After Effects, where I bring in this footage I shot with my phone at my daughter's preschool. There was a bit of pavement showing in the background here, so I took a still frame of the original image, created a pre-comp, and used CC Power Pin to unstretch a square patch. And then I used Kingpin Tracker to paste this patch to the ground plane using the offset tools. None of this needed 3D tracking to accomplish, which is why Kingpin is so great for little paintouts and patches like this. Well, we're also going to use Element and Particular for this little shadow creature, so I do have to run a 3D camera track anyway. I'll establish a ground plane and create a camera. And then in Element 3D, I'll import two things. My skeleton crawl OBJ sequence and this kind of bumpy ground plane geometry. I'll apply a dark, shiny texture to that skeleton. And then on this ground plane thing, I'll make a material that has matte shadows, doesn't create its own shadows, and receives ray traced ambient occlusion. I find things like this are really helpful for 3D integration because it's something that he can cast shadows or ambient occlusion onto that isn't a perfectly flat plane. And all this really helps make the contact points feel more organic. Okay, I did this next stuff a bit out of order, get over it. The skeleton in the Game of Thrones shot is kind of warbly, like he's boiling a bit. And an element under particle look, deform, I'm gonna enable the 3D distortion noise. If your model has enough geometry, you could use this tool to get some really cool results. I'm going to use it pretty subtly. In Element, I'll grab an environment map that I made in my front yard. It seems to work pretty well for reflecting in these shiny bones. I'll add in a light to try to match those of my original footage. I'll make sure shadows are enabled, and then I'll play with the light settings for diffuse shadows and Element's own shadow settings to give me the look that I want. Now to save time going forward, I'm going to pre-render my skeleton as a PNG sequence. So I have it for compositing purposes. I'll also do a depth pass by going to Elements Output Settings and selecting Z Depth. I can adjust the start and end points to give me a nice, helpful map. And then I'll render that out too. Now it's time to smoke this shadow demon up. Now I know what you're thinking. Trapcode Particular can use OBJ sequences to generate particles. 
but that sounds hard and I'm tired, so I'm gonna see if I can generate some smoke with the graphics layer itself. Now, I have a crazy idea, so stick with me here. I'm gonna import my rendered skeleton layer, create two copies. I'll rename one 2D, and the other I'll make a 3D card and attach it to my camera. When a 3D object's attached to your camera, it appears not to move, though it's actually traveling through space along with your camera. If you zero out the orientation, it'll appear to face camera, and if the XY position are set to zero, it'll be centered in frame, just pushed back some amount in 3D space from your camera. Now I'm gonna to switch to a custom side view and enable a guide ground plane layer. This is basically where the original element skeleton was crawling. But now you can see this 3D card moving right through that same space along with the camera. Now switching back to my main camera view, the last thing I need to do is scale the image so it's basically the exact same size as my comp window. I could use an expression for this, but I'm on a roll. Now, why would I do this? One very particular reason, actually. I try so hard not to make puns with the word particular, it's impossible. Trapcode particular can use a layer to emit particles from a 3D layer using its colors in alpha, just like we did in the Infinity War tutorial. I set the layer emitter to be this 3D skeleton, and let me show you what we get almost right off the bat. Cool, right? Now, the reason this is so cool to me is that these particles are being generated in roughly the same space as where that 3D layer was being rendered to. So it'll linger in the right world space even as the camera continues to move. You can kind of see this from the perspective view. Now, watch what happens if these particles were cloudlets that grew in size over time and faded out in opacity. I'll make their lifespan a little shorter and turn the shadowlets on so the whole thing will look a little smokier. Also, let's add a turbulence field under the air physics setting and see how we're doing. Now, particle results will always look different for you on your end, so finessing the settings within your own setup will always lead to the best result for you. Now it's time for that depth map we already rendered. I'll place duplicates of my particular layer in front and behind the skeleton. I'll tweak the settings so they're not exactly the same. But then on this top layer, I'll add a set matte effect. I'll select my skeleton depth map as the layer with effects and mask checked, and source the luminance. Now soloing this, you can see that the depth map makes it look like parts of the skeleton are lost in the fog and others aren't. Because I selected effects and masks here, it means that I can go to my skeleton depth layer and add a curves adjustment. And as I adjust the curves, it'll affect the depth map, allowing me to find a custom amount of obscuration that I want to have. Let's try jazzing it up a little bit more. Just for ease, I'm gonna duplicate my particular layer again. I'll still use the layer emitter, but this time I'll emit fewer particles, but I'll turn on the aux system to continuously emit particles that are the same color. With the turbulence field still intact, the result is basically little particles that shoot off in squiggly patterns, emitting a little trail of smoke behind them. Now these little particle trails are pretty cool, but they look even cooler if I add a CC vector blur to them. Even at the default settings, the result is kind of this cool ink bleed kind of look and effect. I think it's kind of wild. It's kind of stringy, kind of gross. I'll mess with my particular settings in a million more boring ways until I find the right balance of smoke that I like. As a very last touch, I'll also bring in this side smoke element from Action VFX. And then I'll port all the important layers into Super Comp where I can balance and blend them together, making a special use of the Blur Behind tool. We'll crank down the curves and practically day for night this thing. And man, there are some cool looks you can get if you wanted to colorize the smoke or something. Not what they did in the show, but I think it looks cooler. But anyway, you get it. The whole point is to show you that attacking a fully CG character doesn't have to be a big deal, even when it's got some cool character effects and things associated with it. This came together relatively quickly, and I mean, imagine if you weren't, you know, rushing to make a tutorial out of it and spend some real time. It, would, it could look fantastic. Just like you today, my friend. Remember, you can go download that awesome footage hosted by DigitalPigeon.com and make something awesome with it. And then share it with us at Red Giant News, or with me at Action Movie Kid. I mean, after all, I'm, I'm your action movie dad. It wouldn't hurt for you to, you know, tweet me once in a while. <laughs>